All right, what's up you guys? Back at it with another differential geometry stream for you guys. I need to remember to keep close to the microphone. Busted out the old faithful Yeti mic because honestly that last differential geometry stream, if you want to call it that, that I did for you guys, got like a hundred times more views than I was expecting. So thank you for that. And also thank you to everyone who commented. Uh, I encourage you guys to comment on this because it's going to shape what these are like moving forward. And, you know, I really don't care if I get 1% of the views that my last video got on these videos moving forward because I just, I could rant about this stuff all day. I could crank these out like nobody's business and if it weren't for the fact that i have a monday to friday job uh i could easily just like do this every single day you know what i'm saying but uh i decided that so well let me back up in my last video i was reading from section 11 here in chapter 2 of the book differential geometry uh as you may know and it took me about like 30, 40 minutes to just read three pages, basically. And getting into section 12, which we're looking at the table of contents here, it's talking about what's called the principal normal curvature and the osculating circle. So I noticed that it starts really referring back to preliminary definitions or assumptions that were made in the very beginning of the chapter. And I figured that it would be just a good idea before, you know, really pushing forward in this book to at least have one video where I've pinned down some of those preliminary definitions and assumptions just so that I could say in a future video, maybe like, oh, refer back to episode two or whatever. So that's what this is going to be. Today, I'm going to do essentially a seven section speed run of going through this differential geometry book and then in the next video i'm gonna pick up where i'm ending this video and where i pretty much was in last video and starting off in that subsequent video with section 12. anyways so i guess to kick things off though i did say in the comments that i was going to touch on linear algebra a bit uh because that is uh you know a little bit important for this but we're not going to be thinking about you know QR, SVD, LU. So like if that means something more than just random letters of the alphabet, then congratulations. You know enough about linear algebra that you know you could probably do whatever you want. Because from my perspective, uh, that's all computers can really do is linear algebra. So once you know those uh, you know, recipes of algorithms, if you want to call it that. Like if you have an algorithm cookbook of numerical linear algebra routines that you can just implement out, you know, off the dome, then you're pretty much, you know, what whatever you want to do with a computer nowadays is uh, open season for you. But when you go back to stuff like you know, proof-based mathematics, what you really need from linear algebra is just basically the fundamentals of the invertible matrix theorem. So I've got these uh, flashcards here to make my point. You could have, uh, if you don't know what it is, go look it up, what the invertible matrix theorem is. But it's basically saying if you want to solve AX equals B, where A is a matrix, X is a vector, uh, B is another vector, that and you're solving for x you're given a and b something like that like if you if you have these properties of a matrix then you're guaranteed that you can make an inverse of that matrix a and that just cleans up your whole uh solution but um you know doing the calculations is not always what you care about in mathematics you're concerned about these proofs so, okay what are these flashcards about I've got on one side invertible matrix theorem or IMT and a number written on each one and it's there's one through 18. And then on the back of these uh, flashcards, you have all the different, uh, what do you call them? Not theorems, 
uh, corollaries to the main invertible matrix theorem. There are 18 corollaries. And so, you know, one of, we can go to a random one. The columns of A form a basis of Kn, so a space that's n-dimensional, and we're calling it K. The columns of A form a basis for that. So that's what, in, invertible matrix 13. All right, now you grab another random one of these bad boys, and you get, okay, A has full rank. That is, the rank of A is equal to n. Okay, so now you've got invertible matrix theorem 13 and 7. If you can then prove that one implies the other and vice versa, but then do that for every single one of these 18 corollaries of the invertible matrix theorem, you're good to go. But that is super tedious. And, you know, there, it comes, there comes to a point for me where I just don't want to do that because I know that the answer is already out there. And yeah, it strengthens your ability to do proofs and you know you become familiar with the different methods of, but I you know why am I gonna keep that in my head just walking around on the street you know what I'm saying if I have you know I have it written down on flashcards or you can look it up on Wikipedia what do you want from me right so if you had to boil this down the invertible matrix theorem to like what really matters for moving forward in mathematics. This is just my opinion, of course. I would say it comes down to this one right here, which is if it's invertible, then your columns or your rows are linearly independent. They span Kn. So if that's like the, you know, you have real numbers for your entries of your uh, matrix, it's just like a general way of saying n-dimensional real number space. And third, that these columns or rows form a basis of Rn or Kn. So linear independence spanning that set and then the columns forming a basis for that set. Not necessarily an orthogonal basis, but then knowing that that should be true for both those three things, linear independence, span, forming a basis. Those three things work for the rows and for the columns. So it's like three for the rows. Now you get another three for the columns. It also works for taking the transpose of the matrix. That's already half of these 18 total uh, corollaries for the invertible matrix theorem. So uh, from a calculation point of view, though, it just means that you're you know, if you're linearly independent, then the dot product is going to be uh, maximized. If they're linearly dependent, then the dot product is zero. Um, so then, you know, you check that and then you get all of those, uh, you know, the 18 invertible matrix theorem uh, properties for free because, you know, if you really wanted to, you could sit down and show that each one of them implies the other. Anyways. So that's linear algebra, but going back to the table of contents here, uh, if you look at just chapter two, at a kind of high level overview, if you sort of stew on what each of these sections are, it's just taking the concept of the tangent line as it was sort of uh, popularized by Newton, let's say, because I've got planned here a little bit of a tangent about tangents from a historical perspective that I think is a little bit interesting. Uh, you're taking that uh, classical formulation of a tangent, if you will, and also you could say maybe like topological properties of uh, the real number lines, such as neighborhoods. So, you know, going back to epsilon delta proofs, you're looking at uh, the domain as a real number line, you're looking at the range of a function as a real number line, and then you're looking at those epsilon balls or delta balls or epsilon neighborhoods or delta neighborhoods. You could call it a ball or a neighborhood because going back to the contents here then, once you start generalizing to higher dimensions, capping off at three pretty much for the sake of simplicity, you're generalizing the tangent line and the neighborhood concept throughout this chapter, right? So you have the osculating plane is just pretty much uh, 
a higher, you know, the 2D analogy of a tangent line. It's only touching the curve at one point, but instead of it being a line, it's a plane. Same thing if we keep on going down to, uh, what is it, section 19 that's ahead of us, osculating sphere. Haven't even read it yet, but from last episode, right, about osculating plane and what everything I just said, you can kind of infer that an osculating sphere is probably just going to contact a curve at one point, but it's a three-dimensional sphere. It's not a two-dimensional circle, and we're not talking about um, a tangent plane or a tangent line. But having those kinds of rigorously specific definitions for you know these kinds of things is really, really relevant, especially when we're adding on that differential aspect, right? Because we're going to be doing things uh, with, you know, geometrical shapes and whatnot, but with calculus as well. So that's what the whole idea is about. So much for a speed run. This is already 11 minutes. We're in bad shape. So I'm going to start off in the preliminaries, and I'm just going to skim through some of the things. I'm not going to read whole paragraphs here, but anyways, so going down here, we're going to read the definition of a mapping. So let M and M prime be two sets of points in three-dimensional Euclidean space R3. If a rule T is stated, which associates a point P prime of M prime to every point P of M, we say that a mapping or transformation, that is to say more exactly a point transformation, of the set M into the set M prime is given. And then they go through... You know, what is an image or an inverse uh, point, an image point, back and forth? You know what it's about. But just keep in mind that rigorous definition of a mapping because next we're going to define a rigid motion, which is that a mapping is called a rigid motion if any pair of image points has the same distance as the corresponding pair of inverse image points. Fair enough. Um, this, I will note, it implies that we're involving a metric on the space. So there's a defined metric or a distance formula for the distance between two points because that is what is being preserved by this so-called rigid motion. So going back, you could go into the Introduction to Analysis book and you get all of those features of metric spaces whether it's complete or it's compact or it's connected. And, you know, these things touch on topology, which, you know, forming neighborhoods around points in these point sets, that's inherently a topological thing to do, I guess. But, okay, so a rigid motion. Continuing on, we have the transformation from one Cartesian coordinate system to another can be affected by a certain rigid motion of the axes of the original system. Such a motion is composed of a suitable translation and a suitable rotation. A rigid motion which carries a Cartesian coordinate system into another Cartesian coordinate system is called a direct congruent transformation or a displacement. So direct congruent transformation. And I will note here that the set of all direct congruent transformations uh, of a point set form an algebraic group, which is, you know, I've touched on that in a previous video. You have groups, rings, and fields in, you could say, increasing order of um, structure or complexity as far as what you're uh, imposing or you're dealing with on these uh, sets of mathematical objects. Um, but continuing on, because of course this is, like I said, supposed to be a speed run. Uh, well, I don't know. I will note here, this is one of my favorite um, things to just kind of think about that uh, I was exposed to in this book, which is the distinction between alias and alibi as far as how it relates to these direct congruent transformations and mappings and such. Um, the alias is an interpretation where you have a point xi and well, I'll call it uh, xi prime instead of xi tilde. So you have these two different points they're the coordinates of one and the same point with respect to two different Cartesian coordinate systems. That's what alias is. Alibi, however, then these two points then represent the coordinates of two different points with respect to one and the same Cartesian coordinate system. 
That is, the coordinate system remains fixed and the location of the points is changed. So you could interpret mappings and transformations in this way as either the point gets transformed and the uh, overall system remains the same, or the point remains the same and the overall system uh, is changed. That these are both two sides of the same coin, two ends of the same stick, and when you grab a stick, you cannot just grab one end. It's a matter of interpretation, but I think it's worthwhile to note here in the speed run here. Moving on, geometric configurations, which differ only by their location in space, are said to be congruent to each other. Now, this is brought in here because all of these definitions of mappings and direct congruent transformations, etc., it's really just trying to drive home the concept of geometric congruence, but on all of these mappings. So really what you can think of is that the direct congruent transformation uh, is just another way of saying uh, th these curves are congruent or these, uh, you know, whatever point sets are congruent to each other without using a specifically, you know, rigorous geometric term, right? So here's uh, an important point that's going to come into play in uh, later sections, so I guess uh, section 12 particularly. Uh, we have the concept of an equivalence class. So by the means of every one of these groups, we may classify the geometric configurations in R3 into equivalence classes. <clears throat> Two configurations are called equivalent with respect to a certain group, that is, they are contained in one of the same equivalence class, if that group contains a mapping which maps one of the configurations onto the other. I mean, again, it's just really rigorously nailing down what the equals sign means, or um, three parallel horizontal lines which denotes equivalence, if you just say A is equivalent to B or A is equal to B, when you're talking about representations of curves and manifolds and surfaces, it's like, what does that even mean? So it's important to introduce the concept of an equivalence class so that we can uh, work with this. If you want more details, I'm sure you can look this up. Um, moving on. Let's see. All right, so I think we're at, we can skip into now the beginning of the chapter that I'm in, which is theory of curves. So like I said, on this page, this is the very beginning of the chapter. You can already see there are some assumptions here, and these get honestly carried through the rest of the chapter. So if you just drop into section 11 and you don't read these assumptions and you run into trouble, then the fact that you uh, forgot these assumptions, that's why you're having a bad time. Okay, <clears throat> so we have this vector x, and it has three entries, x1, x2, x3, and the vector is in R3. So three dimensions, real numbers, okay? The parametric representation of this uh, vector here entails that each of these entries are single valued functions of a real variable t which is defined on the interval i which is closed at a and b which are its endpoints. The assumptions are super important here. I'm just going to read them off. So one, the functions xi of t where i is one, two, or three are R times continuously differentiable in I. I'm going to say that one more time because just listening to that, it may be hard to understand. The functions of X, which are the entries of this vector function, each one of the functions that are these entries are R times differentiable. You can take a derivative of them R times on this interval I that they're defined on. Second assumption Okay, then key keyword, these are not given for if you just write down functions and stuff and you just say, ta-da, this is my vector function. If you don't have these assumptions, a lot of the stuff 
in the later uh, sections is going to fall apart. So the second assumption is that for every value t in the interval i that these functions are defined on, at least one of the three functions the, that are the derivatives of these functions is different from zero. And if you kind of just think about that, if all three of the derivatives of the entries of this vector function x are zero, then you're not representing a curve, a line, a plane, anything. You're representing just a point, right? Because if each one of the entries of this vector is just a constant, that's how you're going to get derivatives that are equal to zero. And then it's like, okay, well, why are you representing just a single point with a s supposed uh, vector valued function? Like, you know, that's why these assumptions are kind of in there so that it irons out those kinds of uh, ambiguities and how things could be arbitrary or someone could try to pull a fast one on you and have a tricky example that violates one of these assumptions and it makes you look bad because then you're like, oh, my definitions and theorems later on, it doesn't work. Well, it's because you did not uh, check that these assumptions were valid for what you were using going in here. So <clears throat> uh, let's see. A representation of the form of 6, 1, or you know these uh, vector-valued functions, uh, satisfying these conditions will be called an allowable parametric representation. So that shows why I'm reading this now in this episode is because the term allowable parametric representation gets repeated over and over and over throughout this overall chapter, this theory of curves chapter, right? So that's why I felt like it was kind of important that I should go back and more... Uh, deliberately uh, read this definition for you guys. So <clears throat> um, knowing that we have this allowable parametric representation, though, um, we get some nice things. So if we come up with a transformation on that uh, vector value, yeah, vector valued function, we'll call it x star. If that x star transformation of the original allowable parametric representation x satisfies those assumptions. Um, you know, you can see here it lists them out 0 star, 1 star, 2 star. Forget about it. Just if your transformation also satisfies these assumptions, then it's an allowable parametric transformation. So you have an allowable parametric representation. You have a representation or a transformation, excuse me. If that transformation satisfies these, uh, f f camera died, turning it back on, continuing on. If you have your X star transformation and it still satisfies these assumptions, it's an allowable parametric transformation. Why is that important? Well, Satisfying that means you have uh, an inverse transformation. That is to say, an inverse transformation is an inverse transformation exists, which is strictly monotonic, and it's also r times differentiable. So, your original allowable parametric representation, you have these assumptions, and you know that oh, we can have at least r differentiability. Then you have this transformation. And it satisfies, uh, you know, not it doesn't have all of the derivatives equal to zero on this interval and all that. But that means that having that transformation that satisfies the assumption implicitly, you know that the inverse transformation exists and it's going to have all these properties as well. So then at this point, it kind of introduces um, implicit representations because this allowable parametric representation, that's an explicit representation. And I mentioned it very briefly earlier that Euler used these and it was his uh, you know, mathematical work that then now we all adhere to this convention. But when algebraic geometry, so-called, and differential geometry, so-called, were being developed, <clears throat> they weren't all on the same page about what kind of a, rep a representation of these curves to use. And so along the way, we have these implicit representations of curves, such as what's kind of uh, mentioned down here at the bottom of the page. We have 
f with three values x1, x2, x3, but this function f this function f is equal to zero. We have a second function g x1, x2, x3 also equal to zero. These basically give you uh, surfaces that then the intersection of those surfaces f and g that is the point set of the curve that is uh, being represented that's the intention of representing it this way so instead of having a vector valued function three entries each of the entries is the single you know real valued function or whatever that's different than having two uh surfaces in three-dimensional space that then intersect and the intersection is what is your curve also another implicit representation which I'm going to go on a long tangent in this about tangent lines is uh, the whole algebraic curve representation which is um, attributed to Descartes but we're, we're going to get into that um, there's also another alternative representation, but it's not something that gets really brushed aside, which is transforming the input parameter of T on the interval uh, A to B, closed at A, closed at B. You transform it um, using the arc length so that the parameter of your vector valued function X is actually what you can call S, where S is arc length. Turns out that that kind of a transformation on the input space to represent your curve going from just like T, which is, you know, from A to B, you go from that to uh, arc length S. Anyways, that's an example of an allowable parametric transformation, like I just said. So that satisfies these other assumptions and you get all these nice properties back with the allowable parametric representation you started off with. Anyways, so uh, now we're going to get to the actual meat of definitions of what is an arc of a curve. What is an arc, what is a curve? What, what do those even mean? I've been tossing around the words like we, you know, we assume that we know what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. A point set in space R3, which can be represented by the allowable representations of an equivalence class and is then ordered in a certain manner, is called an arc of a curve. I'd like to point out, right, is then ordered in a certain manner. That's kind of why that algebraic property of the real number system as a field, order property, right, every element in the real numbers is either positive, negative, or it's zero and you have inequalities that make sense as we all know from kindergarten, right? How these uh, numbers are in order. That's important here because if you don't have that, then your curve doesn't make sense, basically. The functional correspondence of the points of an arc to the values of t given by an allowable representation is continuous. Given a number, okay, so now we go into just a Simple, straightforward, epsilon delta proof. Um, you know, if you read down here, you have this hence given an arbitrary number epsilon greater than zero. You go to the end of the line and you have this one half epsilon that was chosen very nicely. And then you go down and it just cleans up the math on the epsilon delta proof. Nice and, you know, it's like you've seen this a million times, right? Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. But we have a few more uh, definitions here, which I'm going to circle back to in a moment. It may happen that the vector function has the same value for different values of t. That is, a certain point of m that's in the domain corresponds, or sorry, point of m on the curve corresponds to several values of t in the domain. Such a point is said to be a multiple point of the arc and conversely, an arc of a curve having no multiple point is called simple. So if there are no multiple points, that is where a point T or a, you know, a set of multiple points T in the domain map to the same point in M, that's a multiple point. If you don't have any of those, then you have a simple arc of a curve. Then we have, you know, another proof here. So it's 
if you have a simple curve, then your mapping is one to one. And it just shows this um, with a simple convergent sequences uh, epsilon delta contradiction proof. So you're setting up the proof with um, convergent sequences and you assume that you know the sequence you set up you, you set it up so that it's convergent and then you work out the epsilon delta details and you come up with a contradiction and you get the result that you want. I'm not going to go over this right now, honestly. If you want to, you can read the details. Moving on, definition here. A point set is called a curve if it can be represented by an equivalence class of allowable representations of the form that we saw in the beginning whose interval i is not assumed to be closed or bounded, but which are such that one always obtains an arc of a curve if the values of the parameter t are restricted to any closed and bounded subinterval of i. And keeping on going, we have a curve is said to be closed if it possesses at least one allowable representation whose vector function x is periodic, namely the vector x at the point t perturbed by a value omega, omega is greater than zero, that value of the vector function at t perturbed by omega is the same value of the vector function x as it is at just t unperturbed. Okay, so I'm going to skip a little bit ahead in the speed run, and I'm going to go to section 8 now. It's kind of going back to the implicit representation of a curve given by the intersection of two surfaces. So here's an example. A straight line in space passing through a point xi, which equals ai for these values of i being 1, 2, and 3, can be represented in the following parametric form where the vector function x at t is equal to first entry is a1 plus b1 times t, the second entry is a2 plus b2 times t, and the third entry is a3 plus b3 times t. We're skipping all the stuff that they say about direction cosines because that's not important. What is important is b1 not being 0, then implies that we can isolate t in terms of x1, a1, and b1. Oh god, my camera's gonna die. All right, continuing on. So if b1 is non-zero, then we can isolate t in terms of x1, a1, and b1. And then we can further uh, eliminate, essentially, the variable t from x2 and x3. We can just eliminate uh, t from the representation altogether. And we get some nice equations of planes. And uh, we see down here, right, b3 x1 minus b1 x2 plus a2 b1 minus a1 b2 equals 0. You could just call that f of x1 x2 x3. Um, it doesn't, that first one doesn't depend on x3, but then we have the second one, b3 x1 minus b1 x3 plus a3 b1 minus a1 b3. Okay, so it doesn't depend on x2, but we're going to call this g of x1 x2 x3 equals 0. So then you have both of these two, obviously, equations of planes because, right, a2 b1 minus a1 b2 and a3 b1 minus a1 b3, those are both just scalars, and the coefficients x1, x2, x3 are all first power. So this is the equation of a plane. Both of these are equations of planes, right? And But we started off with the simple parametric representation, a1 plus b1t, a2 plus b2t, and so on. So the problem with this is that not all curves are possible to represent this way, or it's not exactly easy. So in fact, on a previous page, it remarks here, well, what about the curve, for example, uh, x of t equals t for the first entry, t squared for the second entry, and t cubed for the third entry. So 
a little bit tricky there. And um, But we're going to come back to more curve representations when I go on my tangent about tangents here, which might take another 30 minutes. Who knows? We're going to find out. I like this figure here. Figure 8, we have, if you're just listening, there's what looks like the Jesus fish symbol, but the fish is like going up. Or it's a simple hairpin. Or not a hairpin. The The other image here is what I would say is like a hairpin curve. The first one, it could also look like a, a rudimentary omega symbol. But we have five points on each of these curves. We have the uh, Jesus fish curve in figure 8a, and then we have this hairpin loop in figure b. And figure b, it is important to note that if you're watching, we have the segment a, b, c, that is a chord from a circle, or not a chord, That's it's an arc from uh, a circle, so it's like a semicircle, I guess you could say, as is the segment c, d, as is uh, d, b, e. So the figure 8, b right here is the composition of the segments of three different circles. And uh, A is just the, the, this simple Jesus fish uh, curve, right? But why did I go back to this? So the point set itself is way more important than the parametric representation that you apply to whatever point set. Because if you look at the first image in this figure, the Jesus fish, all right, and you've got A, B, C, D, E, Let's say that you traverse the curve in that order, A, B, C, D, E, or you could do another traversal, A, B, D, C, B, E. So if you're watching the screen, A, B, C, D, B, E is one way to traverse this curve, or you could traverse A, B, D, C, B, E. Uh... And you could say, so what? Well, then if you do that same kind of traversal on 8B over here, you do A, B, C, D, B, E, or you could do A, B, D, C, B, E. By being able to do that, it just shows that there is a tangent, which is continuous for both uh, orders of traversing this curve. However, the curvature which is something I'm going to define in when I get to section 12 in hopefully my next video. The curvature is continuous at B only for that first way of traversing, A, B, C, D, B, E. So you can look at these two pictures and just internalize that and good stuff. Uh, I'm almost at the point where I'm going to go on my tangent about tangents, but in order to do that first, some necessary remarks uh, about arc length. Let x of t, the vector value function, on the interval uh, variable t, which is uh, bounded at a and b, close at those values. Let that function be an allowable representation of an arc c of a curve of class r that is at least one. It can be one, so we can do at least one derivative. If we can do more derivatives, that's great. Then the arc C has the length S, which is equal to the integral from A to B of the square root of the sum of the derivatives of X sub I squared. So take the derivative, square them, for, and then sum each of the derivatives for each one of the dimensions or entries of your... Uh, vector x, you take that integral on the whole entire interval that it's defined on, that it has this differentiability on, which is the same as taking the integral of the square root of the dot product of the derivative of this x function with itself. So take the derivative, dot product that derivative with itself, take the square root of that, 
integrate that from A to B. That's just what we're trying to do here. Then that gives you the arc length, okay? And S, uh, I forgot what I said. Then the arc C has that length and this length is, an, is independent of the special choice of the allowable parametric representation. I'm not gonna do the proof. Uh, but I am going to talk about this problem right here, which is, I think it's a very nice example. It's, so we have this representation, which x1 is equal to t, x2 is equal to t times sine of one over t, when t is non-zero, when t is zero, then x2 is zero, and x3 is zero for all values on t which is defined by being t is greater than or equal to zero but it's less than or equal to an arbitrary value t1 and then they have a nice little drawing here of the function here so this representation is continuous even at t equals zero but the corresponding point set which does not form an arc in the sense of our definition has no length. So it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning about how if you don't meet those assumptions, if you don't meet the definitions exactly, then once you skip ahead and you say, oh, I can't, why can't I just take this equation for arc length and just plug and play on and why, why doesn't that work? I think that this is a good proof to just kind of read out loud here. Okay. It suffices to construct a broken line of chords whose vertices in their natural order correspond to increasing or decreasing values of t and whose length is infinite. Without loss of generality, we set t1 equal to 2 over pi. Why is that important? Because 2 over pi, 2 over pi corresponds to the peaks of the curve um, right, because the x2 value when it's non-zero is equal to t times sine of 1 over t. So when you put the t of 2 over pi in, you're calculating the sine of pi over 2. So you're going to be hitting the peaks of the... Uh... What is going on? We let the vertices... Pn of the broken line of chords coincide with the points of the extreme values of the function sine 1 over t. That is, the points corresponding to the values t equals 2 over the quantity uh, 2n plus 1 times pi. So the entire denominator is the quantity 2n plus 1 closed quantity times pi. The numerator is 2. At those points, the absolute value of the, uh, x2 of t equal t and the sine of x2 of t alternates the, the length of the chord between the points pn minus 1 and pn is greater than 4 over 2n plus 1 times pi hence the length of the broken line of chords between the points p0 and pn is greater than 2 over pi times the sum from 1 to capital N of 1 over little n plus 1. As is known, if, F, if n tends to infinity, the value of this sum tends to infinity. So basically it's saying you draw these chords on that function, and when you go towards 0 then basically you get infinite arc length by just approximating the curve proper with these chords. Interesting proof, so I figured I would include it. Okay, so we're, this I scrolled back to section 8 in chapter 2 here, and we have example 3, the folium of Descartes. And this is where the tangent about tangent lines begins because there is an important historical background to this specific example, this specific curve that's mentioned, okay? So 
we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of Western civilization. And I want to shout out whoever this person is who wrote this nice uh, senior master's thesis that I found online called The World Before Calculus, Historical Approaches to the Tangent Line Problem. I encourage you to read it because uh, I've read part of it and it's pretty nice. But we're going to go back to the days of Euclid, okay? And what did what did this guy who's, you know, the father of geometry supposedly when we really know it was the Egyptians, okay? If you go back to the pre-Socratic philosophers and you go back to one of the earliest guys, Thales, T H A L E S, and you know, he was basically a, a Renaissance man avant la lettre, or he's, you know, they could, there wasn't a Renaissance, it's the, the naissance, it's the naître, the first birth, okay? He's, it's not the rebirth of the Renaissance, it's the first one by people like this guy Thales, who is known for the phrase, know thyself, okay? But what this guy did, he was a polymath, essentially, because he uh, was one of the first people to exercise like uh, a futures contract or uh, shorting, you know, like options and stuff like that, like in stocks and commodities. He was like the first guy to do that based upon his prediction of uh, there being a heavy rain in the season. And so there was going to be an abundant olive harvest and so he basically uh made a transaction involving the rights to use olive presses and made a bunch of money that way but you know and then he had that know thyself stuff going on but he also traveled to egypt and learned geometry from them and also made innovations of his own but then that's that's the growth that then Euclid is a part of. And Euclid comes out with all the propositions and stuff about geometry and triangles and all that stuff that you learn in elementary school nowadays that we know and love. Uh, but it really came from the Egyptians, okay? That's all I'm going to say. But Greek geometry by Euclid that made, made it popular in it, classical geometry, right? What was his definition of a tangent line? Well, it comes down to just circles. So if you have a tangent line of a circle, then it just touches the line at one point and it doesn't, what he says, cut the circle at another point. So if you draw a line at just one point, but then at some other point on that line, if it quote unquote cuts, through the circle, then it's not a tangent line. So, you know, they didn't have uh, algebraic representations of curves and all that stuff yet, so that was the best he could do. And it got a little bit advanced by uh, um, these guys named like Apollonius of Perga, who um, gave us what we now know as like conic sections. So, again, going back to elementary school mathematics if you have the two cones and you have a plane and you cut through the cones in different ways you get hyperbolas parabolas you still get lines you still get points but that was like the best that was the most they could do with like curves and geometry really yeah there was archimedes and he had his spiral of archimedes but we don't really care about that from Archimedes, right? We just care about uh, fluid displacement, buoyancy, the volume of an object can be known by putting it in water. How much fluid does it displace? I don't know, burning mirrors as well, because that's another thing. Uh, light and optics, by the fact of light always traveling the shortest path from the source to where it uh, projects or whatever, reflects right that's something that's been known since these times and people like archimedes with that much of an understanding of light were able to construct things like burning mirrors right but then after that there was like another thousand years after apollonius archimedes and all these guys there was a thousand years where nobody 
made any innovations in mathematics on tangents. But then we get to our boy Descartes and Fermat. These are French guys, and Fermat, Pierre de Fermat, is not a mathematician proper. He was actually a lawyer. Born in 1607, here I've got his Wikipedia page pulled up for you guys. Born in supposedly 1607, contemporary with René Descartes, who was born 1596. And this whole tangent line kicks off because what were these guys studying? Oh yeah, light. And what's the property of light? Oh yeah, it travels those shortest paths like I mentioned. So because they're, you know, smart people who are investigating these natural phenomena, which are timeless, you could say, because we haven't gone to the end of the universe, so you don't know if gravity and light and all these things have different properties uh, at future points of time in the universe. But this guy Fermat and uh, Descartes, they're like uh, going back to things like Snell's Law. So when you've got incident light going into... Uh, media with different, um, you know, coefficients of reflection and all that, then the angle changes when light goes from air into water, you know, light goes from water into air. So this guy, Fermat, was coming up with a method to find maxima and minima, which is motivated by his uh, studies into the reflective properties of um, light. And I will say that for 200 years, basically, after Descartes and Fermat, those were the most tricky properties of light that were confounding mathematical descriptions of light at the time, where things like uh, refract refraction, reflection, refringence, birefringence, all those sorts of things were really um, giving these guys a hard time. Um, but Okay, so Fermat was born in 1607, Descartes was born in 1596, and these guys come to a head in about 1637. So Fermat is about 30 years old, 29, 30. He's about my age, okay? And Descartes is like 10 years older than him. So it, could you imagine someone my age or something going up to a guy 10 years older who is René Descartes, Okay, je pense donc je suis, I think therefore I am. Okay, he's got all this cogito ergo sum stuff going on. And this guy Fermat is basically saying, hey, I've developed a method for finding uh, tangent lines, which is better than yours. And so we've got, what, what, what is uh, Descartes' method? What is Fermat's method? Well, Descartes was kind of going off of um, a kind of Euclidean approach, you can maybe say, by looking at, well, if you have this line that's tangent to the curve, then you can intersect the x-axis with that uh, preliminary tangent line, and then you can draw a circle and, uh, you know, a perpendicular line to that initial tangent line. Um, can act as the radius of a circle. So it's kind of like reminiscent of that whole, your tangent line just can't cut the uh, circle that it's tangent to kind of idea. But Fermat's idea is actually reminiscent of the limit definition um, that Newton came up with. And actually Newton even says... Uh, it, or is reported to have said that he actually was inspired by Fermat's uh, method of finding tangents for then his for Newton himself's version that he popularized in Principia, uh, which was published in 1687. It's like 50 years after Fermat and Descartes are going back and forth about this. Descartes is using this proto-Euclidean, you know, tangent lines are where you can only touch the circle once. It doesn't cut the circle. Uh, Fermat's method looks a lot like what Newton would use later, but, he, but Fermat doesn't use limits at all. And they're going back and forth. I think this is very interesting. I would also note 
Uh, this is from the Wikipedia page for analytical geometry. I'm going to read a little part here. It says, The key difference between Fermat's and Descartes' treatments is a matter of viewpoint. Fermat always started with an algebraic equation and then described the geometric curve that satisfied it, whereas Descartes started with geometric curves and produced their equations as one of several properties of the curves. Okay? So there's also... Basically, it's not the concept of finding a tangent line as far as we modern uh, people regard that we inherited from what we say is Isaac Newton. It was really already basically completely baked between Fermat and Descartes. They had the whole entire concept between these two people basically like split between their brains. It's like... A modern person, me, I've got, I know what, I know how to do tangent lines and all this stuff. I go back in time, but I'm trolling, and so I give Descartes the proper notation, but the not exactly the right concept. But then I give Fermat the correct concept, but not exactly the right uh, notation. And then Fermat is a lawyer by trade, so he just goes home at the end of the day, and he has a freaking math book, and he just writes stuff in the margins. And, you know, then we get Fermat's last theorem from that. And but no, nobody cares. Nobody cares because he's a freaking lawyer, right? It's tragic. But, uh... Oh, my gosh. What more was I going to say? Okay. So we have the volume of Descartes. Where is this all going? So the... Let me get this straight. Descartes, once he heard that from, uh, they had these buddies like Mersenne. I don't know if you've heard of Mersenne Primes, okay? These guys were all contemporaries. They're a bunch of French, French scientists, mathematician guys. Descartes is like, oh, Mersenne, your boy Fermat, I heard he's got this tangent line method. Well, I've got this curve here, uh, which I bet, I bet he can't find the tangent line for. And as a matter of fact, I have this other source here. It's not a, a book or anything, but it says Descartes didn't even know the full shape of this curve. He had the equation, okay, x cubed plus y cubed minus 3axy equals zero. Uh, he thought that the whole thing, looked the, the pedal in the first quadrant would repeat in all of the other quadrants and that this would look like the petals of a flower. Little did he know that for values of, you know, negative infinity to negative one, you get the right wing, I guess you could say. And then from values of uh, negative one to zero, you get the left wing. And then for values... Uh, in the parametric equation, of course, I'm talking about, when you get positive values, non-zero, then that's when you get the little loop here in the first quadrant. So he didn't even have the whole shape of the curve. But then Fermat walks in, and he is able to uh, draw the, or come up with the correct representation of the tangent lines. So I think that is uh, pretty interesting. That's my historical tangent on tangents. So, being that I just gave that tangent, we can pretty much skip over most of section 10. Um, what I do want to touch on is that the sense of a tangent line corresponds to increasing values of s, the arc length, and it thus depends on the choice of parametric representation. So, if you represent your parametric curve in different ways, then you could have a tangent that is tangent indeed at a specific point in a valid way, but its sense could be altered. So obviously the tangent can be represented in the form vector y at u is equal to vector x plus u times vector t, where vector x and vector t depend on the point of c under consideration and u is a real variable. Another definition real quick. The normal plane is the totality of all vectors orthogonal to the unit tangent vector 
and all of these vectors lie in a plane. <sighs> Man, this video is already getting pretty long. Okay, and to end this, I'm going to try to make good on my word and return to the example that I said I was going to start this episode with because in the last episode I said, oh, I'm going to return to this example at the beginning of the next one. And now here we are at the end of the next episode, but I'm not going to leave it out. Okay. So to regather where we were, the osculating plane O, so osculating remember means to kiss it's just kissing the curve at just one point it's not a f plane it's an osculating plane it's analogous to a tangent line okay if you're not following on this at this point in the video then i mean this video sucks i guess i don't know what to tell you so the osculating plane o of the circular helix vector x of t at r cosine t r sine t c t for the third value, can be represented in the form of this determinant where the first column is uh, an arbitrary vector that's uh, anchored at the origin and it goes up and it's within this osculating plane that's spanned by two vectors. You've got this initial point P that's on the curve and you have P1 and this other one P2. The span makes this plane and z is an arbitrary point that the vector goes from the origin and goes up to this plane. z minus x, which is just any value on this helix, that's the first column of this determinant. Second column is the first derivative of the representation of this circular helix. And the third column is the second derivative. This determinant all equals zero. Do the math and you get this nice representation of the osculating plane at a particular value of t on this helix. t is not on the helix, it's a input into the representation of the circular helix. Okay, be careful there. z1 times c sine t minus z2 c cosine t plus the quantity z3 minus ct times r equals zero. I'm going to do a little bit of a physicist sleight of hand, pull the wool over your eyes, you know, hand wavy move here. I'm just going to set uh, C equal to H bar equal to one. And that's just to say I'm going to erase C here in everything that follows here. So it goes and says, yeah, we get this osculating plane and it's tangent to the helix. And then we have this line Z star of A, where A is a real parameter. And we have A cosine T, A sine T, and C T for this Z star vector, which refers to then as the principal normal to the helix. Okay. And when I was looking at this uh, for, frankly, the first time in the end of the last episode, I was a little bit thrown off because I was like, okay, we've got this tangent line, and then we have this part where it says, this line is parallel to the x1, x2 plane. And I was like, wait a sec, tangent line, no, it's not. But it was actually referring to this z star, um, the principal normal, that is indeed um, parallel to the x1, x2 plane. So I figured, you know what, I'm gonna crack open MATLAB here and we're going to just put the equations in and we're going to verify that this stuff actually geometrically uh, works out. So first we're going to come up with a input vector, an input vector, which is t. And we'll space the lines out by 0 0.1 and we're going to go from 0 to 4 pi. We could go up to just 2 pi, but we wouldn't really see, we would just see 1 loop of the curve. It's a little bit nicer to show a little bit more, but I don't want to show so much that we're just like, what the heck is going on here? And it might make it hard to see the tangent line and principal normal once I plot them on here. So we've got T. Let's get our first look at our lovely circular helix. But uh, also I'm going to invert the X1 axis because it's going to make it a little bit easier to visualize. You're going to see why in a moment. So when you're following along with these, if you are, um, just note that all my commands 
uh, I'm going to be negating or inverting the x-axis for you. So here we go. And the reason why I did that inversion, you can appreciate perhaps right here. In the front, we have a somewhat awkward x1 axis that goes from one positive one on the left to negative one on the right. But the first point corresponding to t equals zero is right here on the x1 axis. And then it spirals up for increasing values of t from there. And so let's plot the tangent line. And to obtain the equation for the tangent line, super simple. You just take the derivative of this circular helix, each one of the entries, and then you have uh, the point that you want to have your tangent at. I'm going to choose pi over 2 equals t because at pi over 2, you're going to be, if you project down onto the x1, x2 plane, you're crossing the x2 axis for the first time there. So, and you don't have uh, x1 or x2 equal to 0. It doesn't really matter here, but that's why I chose pi over 2. So, and keep in mind, like I said, I inverted the x axis. And I'm going to fix the axes for you guys. Yeah. OK, so now we have this new red line showing up here. And notice that I intentionally did not plot this line using values of negative infinity to infinity. I just used the values of t that were used to construct the circular helix that it's tangent to. So. The reason why is look at the direction that this tangent line is pointing. If I put in negative t, then we get a second line which has the opposite sense. Okay, and I'll just do that now. This is kind of going back to what it was saying about the uh, choice of the parametric representation of your curve will affect the sense of the tangent lines that you calculate based upon that representation. And, you know, going back probably like 30 minutes earlier in this differential geometry stream is that the point set itself is more important than the parametric representation. So you have to be careful with this stuff. So I just used negative T and we get a line in the opposite direction. So it's opposite sense to the proper tangent according to the uh, parametric representation that we committed to in the beginning. That's an aside. I guess um, I'm going to further now plot that z star uh, vector here, which I was a little bit confused by when I first read this. But once you plot it, everything works out as you would expect. So what is the principal normal? Here we go. And so we now have a purple line. And to give it more context, I'm going to plot the axis of the enclosing cylinder of the circular helix here. And then I'm also going to plot um, a circle on the x1, x2 plane, which is just the projection of the entire helix down onto the x1, x2 plane. Or Yeah, you get what I'm saying. So there's our x1, x2 unit circle. And now I'm going to plot the axis of the enclosing cylinder. All right. And there you have it. So everything works out. We were given this vector x of t, r cosine t, r sine t, c t. We're just going to say, c equals h bar equals 1. For simplicity, we get this nice osculating plane equation. And indeed, you could see this line here, tangent. You could imagine then a plane that is around the cylinder. It's kind of like we've got the, this is an approximate cylinder. This is an approximate plane. And there you go. That's what it is. And then there's a spiral going up the cylinder. And 
this plane is loaded with tangent lines. So it just depends on where it is on that helix enclosed by the cylinder. And, you know, we've got this purple line here, which represents our principal normal. And indeed, you can infer, hopefully, with your geometrically inclined brain and eyes, you can see that this principal normal, it's perpendicular to the axis of the enclosing cylinder, and it's parallel to the x1, x2 plane. And we're going to end it there. Thanks for watching today's differential geometry stream. Stay tuned for the next one. Peace.